Awesome. Well, morning. Thanks for having me. I'm really happy to be here and uh, talk to you in a very direct and, and hopefully sort of open-minded fashion about um, open networking, software-defined networking, open flow, whatever we want to call it. Um, there's a bunch of things that all, in my mind, kind of kind of roll together, um, but all stand the chance to uh, to change this industry and really revolutionize the industry, uh, which I think is a, is a key word, and you'll hear me repeat it in, in a moment. Um, but first, I wanted to point out, just because I was uh, on the agenda as being part of Facebook, that I'm actually no longer with Facebook. Uh, I joined in, uh, in uh, mid-2007 and left at the end of September. And during that period of time, our users, the, the number of people that used Facebook grew from about 40 million to over 800 million uh, on a monthly basis. And there's about 500 million people that use the site every day. Um, so like a lot of you and like a lot of other enterprises, whether you're at a bank or an oil and gas company or an, uh, a, a, a consumer internet company, we experienced a lot of growth. Uh, this is just a little bit about me. Uh, I'm sometimes called a rebel, sometimes called uh, an, an investor, sometimes called an entrepreneur, sometimes just a guy who likes to stir the pot. And uh, as Guru mentioned, uh, have been involved in OpenFlow and the Open Network Foundation for about two years. Uh, and really just excited to, uh, to see this, this concept, a set of concepts come to life. Um, this is just a little bit of gratuitous Facebook action. Since I did work at the company, I thought I'd share it. This is my timeline, and, and that's a picture of Kaiser Soze, who's my dog. Um, he and I, a couple of weeks ago, uh, rewired our home network, and uh, he was very good at, at crimping cables. Um, but what he actually told me what he, he actually told me what he really wanted was his own kind of firewall, his own virtual network. And if he could only have that, he'd, he'd really love that. So uh, I have to now download both the Big Switch and NYSERA controllers and, and do some, some coding at home. All right, uh, I'm going to um, hopefully go through this re relatively quickly, but uh, that should leave time maybe for a few questions at the end. I literally just showed up from the airport, so I apologize um, in that I'm not super familiar with how the other talks have gone. First, I just want to look a little bit at some of the scaling challenges we had at Facebook over the years. Uh, you know, First, I'll take you back to 2007 when I joined. Uh, we thought we had a lot of users and, and a lot of challenges, and really we were focused on keeping the site up every day. And we continued to invest and really focus our investments in software engineering and in writing code that was not only products that users would use, but infrastructure to actually support those products. And over the course of the last four or five years, depending on how you look at the calendar, the in a pace of innovation has actually accelerated. The company has released uh, uh, dozens, if not uh, over 100 products, and contributed to many different open source projects, um, all of which I think speak to the importance of software in a business like Facebook or uh, any other development shop. By comparison, I think Facebook has today about 500 people working in, in engineering, uh, maybe a little bit more, 600 people. But by comparison, we're a small development shop compared to Bank of America or Fidelity or a large financial institution. So these guys ought to be contributing in similar fashions to us to the movement of open networking and of software-defined networking. So all of this growth presented a lot of challenges. Uh, just going to talk briefly kind of about two themes that I really think are intertwined today. The first is innovation, and the second is how you leverage openness as it relates to innovation. So first, as I mentioned, uh, we spent a lot of time innovating in software and in building software. And I actually was going through on the plane sort of the list of projects that either were inspired by Facebook, uh, instigated by Facebook, or that we contributed to, or that we borrowed from. And there were literally 200. And I was going to do this cool little animation and graphic, and it just didn't, didn't work out. Um, but the, I think the key thing of, of this slide is actually what's not on it which is the network is not on it, right? We've got a lot of innovation taking place in software and in our software stack. We did some innovation in servers, which I'll talk about in a moment, and also in data centers, which is, a, was, which is another big piece of an infrastructure for any online services company. Generally speaking, infrastructure is the second largest cost of an online services business. Any improvement we can make there economically or efficiency-wise can have dramatic impact to the bottom line. This is the gratuitous logo slide instead of all of the projects. Sort of skip past that. Um, but so as we've built, face, as Facebook was being built, we always had this idea of building using open standards, open technology, and, and quite frankly, open stacks. And Facebook wouldn't have been possible without open source software. We couldn't have built Facebook on uh, 
any, any kind of commercial software. It would have been too expensive, too confining, and too constrained. And so as such, uh, we launched earlier, or the, excuse me, they now at this point, uh, earlier this year launched a project called the Open Compute Project. And uh, Open Compute really represents some innovation that we, we're pretty excited about, and, and myself included since I'm still involved in the project, uh, in the hardware realm. And this is what I was talking a little bit about in terms of innovating in servers and data centers. The Open Compute Project is the first of its kind, and it's open, it's a set of server standards, motherboard, uh, chassis, planar, power supply, et cetera, as well as data center standards. But again, nothing to do with the network. We're getting there, we're getting there. This was actually kind of the first inspiration, the first design for data center. And I think just to me, I love sh showing this picture. It's Jay Park's napkin. It was the first thing he grabbed in the middle of the night when uh, solving a, an electrical bus problem. And it just goes to show that more than dot-com businesses can be built on napkins. So as I said, we built several different components inside of, inside of the Open Compute Project, really focused on servers and, and the data centers. We're actually taking a hard look at the role the network plays and the role infrastructure software plays inside of Open Compute. And there's, a, there's an Open Compute Summit, I think, next week, and that's going to be uh, sort of looked at uh, and, and discussed further. So, as I said, these two topics were really intertwined, and fundamentally the message here is um, innovation is not possible without openness. And one of the things that, that I remember from uh, my career about 12 years ago uh, is we had this big debate. I was at a large telco at the time. Uh, it was based in Rochester. Uh, it's called Frontier Communications, and shortly thereafter it was acquired by Global Crossing, for those of you who remember that, that period of telecom boom. Uh, we built a lot of networks, both domestically and internationally, and some were successful and, and others were not. Um, but one of the interesting things was uh, we faced this big debate inside the company. We had this decision, and, and it, I, I remember this vividly, and, and you'll see why in a moment. And it was, do we build an ATM network, this proprietary network, I think four systems wanted to sell it to us, or maybe it was Cisco or someone else, uh, you know, fixed packet, uh, not, not super flexible, we'd have to put IP on top of it, or did we just build a native IP network? What were we gonna do? And the preference of the company, we were sort of this, uh, I, I got to the company by, by way of acquisition, the preference of the company was, we're telco. We want to use telco standards. We want to use ATM. It's a well-defined spec. A lot of other people are using it. This IP thing is new and crazy, and we're not really sure how to support it. We're not really sure how to sell it. We don't know. And uh, so you know, we spent a lot of time sort of building PowerPoint presentations and running analyses and bringing in folks from Cisco and, and other outside experts and obviously talking to our competitors, guys like Sprint and AT&T and Quest, and they were having some similar, similar debates inside of their company build a ATM or maybe even frame relay-based network versus an IP network. And uh, it all came down to a game of ping pong for us. Uh, spent a lot of time convincing the board and the management team that we needed to spend, I think it was $50 million or something like that, to build this network out of IP versus ATM. And the spread was, the, the, sorry, that was the total budget. The spread was maybe $10 million or something like that. And uh, this you know, long debate of well, what's the ROI going to be on that money? Are we actually going to be able to sell more products and services as a result? And CFO and I ended up just, just sort of deadlocking, and we couldn't, couldn't break the deadlock. And at the time, there was a ping pong table outside in kind of our, our common area. And so we just said, let's play a little match. Whoever wins the match, that's going to determine the technology. <laughs> You've always wondered how big strategic decisions are made. <laughs> that's how it happens. Thank goodness we ninja that shit. That was just, that was awesome. So we convinced the company to build an IP network instead of an ATM network. And I think that was a, very, that was a pivotal moment for our, for our business, as well as at the industry, er, as well as across the industry. But fundamentally, it's really difficult to see the future without a crystal ball. And if you rewind the clock to 1998, it was pretty obvious that IP was going to take over, but it wasn't guaranteed, it wasn't assured. Telcos and network operators are making the bulk of their revenues from selling virtual private networks on ATM or totally private networks on, on frame relay services, not networks on top of the internet. There was no such thing as quality of service, or there was, but it was a myth. It didn't really work. Uh, but you could guarantee quality using these private networking technologies. And I think the interesting thing that, that comes out of that is IP was open. By virtue of 
us and all of our peers investing in IP, the, it was a massive wave of innovation that followed across the industry. Because all of a sudden there was all this dollars going into figuring out how to make IP work. It turns out we needed some other technologies. We needed things like MPLS or label switching and, and other kinds of things to be able to actually have quality of service or, or other types of controls across the network. And quite frankly, I think we're faced with a similar question and dilemma today, which is today we live in a world where it's constrained by firmware. It's not necessarily open, but it's very interoperable, very standards-based. I think our, the, the decision we're at today is how do we go from being constrained by firmware and really this evolution over the last 12 years, 15 years of evolving technology, it's getting better and better, more interoperable. Today, BGP actually works between multiple vendors and OSPF works between multiple vendors. 12 years ago, that wasn't the case, right? You, you stick a Cisco box in your network and a Wellfleet box in your network and you'll spend a lot of late nights trying to get them to talk and you'll realize that they're actually in totally incompatible. So we see, and, and, and I personally see, this as the next revolution in networking, not the next evolution. So we talked a little bit about, uh, very briefly, uh, some of the innovation that's happened in servers and storage, and if you just sort of think about over the last 12, 15 years, the amount of innovation that's taken place in the server domain. We used to have uh, multiple microarchitectures in the market. Today, there's fundamentally one mi dominant microarchitecture, x86. And, but part of the virtue of x86 is that it's interoperable with everyone. There are multiple vendors. To, uh, to, to, to both compete in terms of innovation and compete in terms of economics. But that same, same, same flexibility, if you will, doesn't exist in networking. We fundamentally have to buy technology from, uh, as a user from a vendor, uh, from a supplier, integrate that technology, and build a layer or a wrapper around it in order to be able to control it. If we want to have a network management system, I have to figure out how to program my network management system to access a Cisco box versus a Juniper box versus some other third-party box. Um, having to do that work puts a lot of load on us as users, and fundamentally, I think we ought to change that. I think it'd be wonderful for the users to be able to control their own destiny rather than uh, having to accept what is, built, what is built for us. So as I mentioned uh, literally seven minutes ago, uh, we've been involved with the ONF for about, uh, for about two years and uh, just wanted to just give you the direct reasons why. And it's pretty simple. We're really excited, and I'm personally really excited about open standards. Anything that I can go in and touch or be able to influence and control fairly easily. That gives me a lot of flexibility and it gives me a lot of comfort as a user. And that's something as a user, as a, whether it's a, as a website operator or as a large enterprise IT shop, really motivates me. The second is that all of the participants are motivated to interoperate. They have they're, 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 the by virtue of being of sort of driving and defining an open standard, all of a sudden the motivation to interate, inter interoperate excuse me, goes way up. Because I know that I can't be successful on my own as an island. I actually need to partner with all of the other people in this ecosystem. And I think one of the really interesting things about OpenFlow and the specs continuing to, e to evolve, and I think we're, we're on the precipice here of, uh, of seeing the 2.0 2 spec, is exactly where are all of the abstractions and where are all of the APIs? How as an application developer can I not care or worry about the network, but I can just call an interface and send a packet down it and know that it's going to make it to the other end and know that the quality is going to be assured relative to all of the other traffic on the network? That's really, really exciting to me as a developer. Instead of, as an application developer, having to worry about what queue do I open and what toss bit do I set and how am I supposed to do this and how am I supposed to do that? I don't want to have to worry about it. I want another, pe another intelligent piece of software to have to worry about it. And at Facebook, uh, one of the things we spent a lot, of times, a lot of time looking at is it was exactly that, and being able to break apart uh, the, the, um, the basic components, if you will, of being able to assemble not just a website, but an application stack. So to make it as easy as possible for product engineers to write product code, in our case in PHP, have a set of in a massive and wonderful infrastructure team uh, in place to not only scale the code, but optimize the heck out of it and make it truly robust and, and, uh, and, and flexible, rather than coupling those things together. And that, I think, is fundamentally the challenge with today's networking technology is it's incumbent on the user to fully define and fully scope their intent when you're writing your application. You can't depend on the operating system to do just some magical amount of work for you. You have to tell the operating system specifically what you're trying to do and how you're trying to, and, and, and what the uh, end result ought to be. 
Here's a couple links to find a little bit more information, not only about uh, Facebook's work in the software domain and in the hardware domain, and hopefully shortly uh, more in, and more and more contributions to the ONF and into OpenFlow. Uh, unfortunately, we haven't had the resources to, that, that we'd like to be able to dedicate to working on OpenFlow. There's a couple of guys here from Facebook on the infrastructure software team, and uh, I know they're chomping at the bit and they want to do more, whether it's uh, instantiating and writing services um, or actually just simply turning up and testing uh, different silicon vendors' switches using OpenFlow as a control mechanism on, on top of it. For us, it's been a bit of a resource constraint. So if you're looking for a large environment to do that in, uh, you should think about, um, think about helping, helping Facebook, especially now that I'm no longer there. It's not even a recruiting pitch. <laughs> That's all I got. Uh, short and sweet. I'm happy to answer questions, because I think we have a little bit of time.